William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Overexertion can be dangerous, folks, but no exercise at all is even worse. Complete inactivity can only mean you're either muscle-bound or dead. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Every profession has its system of reciprocal favors among colleagues. A doctor consults a fellow practitioner. Lawyers put their heads together. And even private police operatives requisition each other's time and brain power. The colleague and competitor who sought my aid one fine day was a chap named Max Marcy. Marcy operated a one-man investigation agency a half mile from the dump I call my own. Not too young, Marcy. Long in years. Ready for retirement, but too poor to afford it. Uh, I'm 35 years in the business, Craig. I'm afraid there's only one way I know of to quit. Feet first, huh? In a pine box, yes. What keeps you coppering, Max, when you could be riding a rocking chair? Uh, the same thing that started me working three decades ago. Food, shelter, and the high cost of government? A livelihood, yes. Nothing socked away, Max? Oh, maybe $500 in war bonds. Not much for a lifetime in harness. You know, there's an old axiom, Craig. Yeah, it's up there on my wall, reading Cops Die Broke. Work for me, Craig. On what? The man I frankly find impossible to locate. For three weeks now, I've used every trick I know, every avenue. His name? Anatole Barber. The only clue I have is that he was once a rug dealer. A rug dealer? Oriental rugs. Fifteen years ago, he had a store on Third Avenue. Cold trail, huh? Cold like ice. Who assigned you to look for Anatole Barber? And that information is confidential. I understand. Client doesn't want his name bandied about. So you're really stuck, huh, Max? Oh, not so much stuck as... Uh, as? Sick. Exhausted. I, I don't have the old strength. You know, the, the machine runs down. This coming October, I'm 64, Craig. Then why not just dump a tough case? Why aggravate yourself? $2,000. Who can dump $2,000? <laughs> no cop I know. Find Anatole, Barber. I'll split with you. Uh-uh. The fee's all yours. I'll just tap you for expenses. Barber, a one-time rug dealer. You've, of course, got a full description of him. Uh, even a photograph. Oh, Craig, I, I don't know how to thank you. Hmm. I'm not doing it for you, Max. I'm really doing it for me. I look at you and I see me. Me, a quarter of a century hence. I'm out asking a younger cop to help me stay in business. One cop runs into a blank wall. Another cop finds a door through the wall. The luck of the game. What was tough for Max Marcy was easy for me, as it turned out. An ex-Oriental rug dealer is a member of a clan. The tricky science of rugs limits the colony of dealers to a small, tight elite. One big family of operators, so to speak. My information on Anatole Barber came from a gentleman named Amar Serebi. Yes, Anatole Barber is well known to me. Under which rug is he hiding? Mm, for a long time now, Anatole is not in our trade. He had a store on Upper Third Avenue some 15 years ago, I hear. Yes, the Mecca Bazaar. He was the cleverest trader of all of us, Anatole. But he folded his tent. Why he gave up his business, nobody knows. You make it sound mystifying. Mm. Fine oriental rugs are more than a business, Mr. Craig. They are a culture and a passion. I might even say a cult. It is in our blood. Now, really enlighten me, huh? Where can I find your renegade colleague, Anatole Baba? He lives in Sackett Bay. Uh, Sackett Bay out in Long Island? Yes. He's using his mother's name now, Belmar. His mother was English. Anatole Belmar. Yes. Tell me, 
How is it you have Anatole Baba Belmar's whereabouts at your fingertips? Oh, we have a trade association. I am corresponding secretary. Even though Anatole is retired from our trade, he has faithfully kept up his dues. I see. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Serebe. I've been privileged. Uh, you are perhaps interested in a fine Bokhara rug at a great sacrifice price. Mr. Serebe, please, let go of my coat lapels. I phoned Max Marcy the good news. Hello, Max. Yes, Greg? That $2,000 fee, start spending it. You found Anatole Barber? Anatole Barber Belmar. He's using his mother's maiden name. Lives out in Sackett Bay. 30 miles out in Long Island, Max. Craig, I'm at a loss for words. Why, it's hardly been 12 hours. No bouquets, Max. It happens. The breaks. I got the breaks. Okay for me to follow through in Sackett Bay? Uh, just to verify his presence there, how he's established. Uh, Craig, don't alarm the man into flight. I'll pose as a door-to-door salesman. Max, don't worry. Uh, telephone me from Sackett Bay. Will do. So long. At Sackett Bay, Long Island, the guy with blue freckles in the general store told me where to find Anatole Belmont. On an island a half mile off the mainland. Anatole B was known around Sackett Bay as the recluse type. The gent with a black patch over his eye ferried me to Belmar's Island. He drove the leaky motorboat like a suicide, as many knots an hour as he had kinks in his brain. Hey, Buster, slow down. Hey, Buster, I'm two premiums behind in my insurance. No answer. Either a deaf mute or not the talking type. I found a suitable prayer and began to mumble it. Belmar's Island had overstuffed seagulls on it the size of vultures. It also had a shack. A shack put together with paper, paste, and wire. I knocked politely. Oh, uh, Anatole Belmar. No answer. I did the impolite thing. I just walked in. Inside, I again did the polite thing. I removed my hat. You generally do if you've got visiting manners. You even make a special point of remembering to remove your hat in the presence of the dead. How dead was Anatole Belmar? Dead beyond recall. He was hanging by his neck from a beam eight feet off the floor. I changed my first diagnosis of suicide when I saw the lump on his head. He'd been slugged and strung up by somebody hoping to pass it off as suicide. I had news for the local police, and after that, I had mournful news for Max. Back in Manhattan, USA, I gave Max the mournful news. Funny thing, though, Max wasn't too surprised. All day today, I anticipated just what you've now told me, Craig. You guessed I'd find Anatole Barber Belmar dead? I guessed, yes. Where do you hide your Ouija board? Oh, I'll explain, but first tell me if you smell something. Smell? Yeah, smoke. I smell smoke. Come, I'll show you why. In my fire room. Look, Craig. You've had a fire in here, huh? When, Max? This morning. How come the fire was localized to the one room? Uh, Chemical extinguishers. The building porter discovered the fire. He broke down the door and managed to put the fire out. An incendiary fire, obviously. Plain as my nose. And said nose is as plain as an aviation landing strip. I see papers were pulled out of your cabinets, piled on the floor, then a match lit to the pile. When I found the fire, I knew at once you'd find Anatole Barber dead. What's your theory there? The client who engaged me to find Anatole Barber. I had his signature on a retainer, a form I regularly use in my agency every time I take on a case. So? I've carefully reconstructed the pattern of the fire. What files were burned, I asked myself. Who'd have some interest in destroying a section of my files? And you finally fixed on this one client? The only active account I've had in six weeks. His file was among those destroyed. Well, it's a bit arbitrary as a conclusion, Max. They're not so arbitrary when you're related to the murder of Anatole Barber. It's a fact, Craig. The purpose in engaging me was to find Anatole Barber Belmar so he could be murdered. And this trick with my files was to erase every clue there could be to the murderer. The murderer being the man who engaged you in the first place? Yes. 
What was the signature on that retainer form? Alan Merritt. A traceable signature, no doubt. Since for a cop to find in some public record, that's why he had to recover it and destroy it. Yes. And the fire was set to confuse matters as a cover-up. It is Alan Merritt. What does he look like, Max? Oh, like anybody. Nothing distinctive to his appearance. He's average in height, build, complexion, dress, speech. Oh, great. What reason did he give you for wanting you to round up Anatole Barber? The barber owed him $10,000 from an old business investment. He wanted to locate Barber so he could file civil suit. A uh, fish story. A lie, yes. Surely a lie. Uh, Max. Yes, Craig. The sad truth is, in finding Anatole Barber, you gave an unwitting assist to a murder. Also, to uh, give credit where credit is due, so alas did I. We were finger men. One other thing, Max. What? This alias Alan Merritt. Even with the traceable signature on that retainer form no longer worrying him, he's still got a loose thread dangling. A thread that can become a hangman's noose. What thread? You two ever come face to face? You can identify him. I can, yes. Are you reading my mind, Max? Yes. This alias Alan Merritt, to really be safe, he... He must also kill me. That chance meeting face to face, somewhere, sometime, fate's little irony. Your client must right now be fretting over it. He'll try to kill you, Max. And that puts us right back in business. Or well, puts me in a grave. To get at you, he's got to show himself. He shows himself and I nab him. Craig. What, Max? After you make the arrest, please see that Max Marcy gets a decent burial. <laughs> a hearse drawn by 16 prancing chorus girls, Max. I make you that promise. In due time, the attempted murder of Max Marcy, Private Eye, came to pass. On a quiet street in the noonday sun, Max leaning conspicuously against a store window reading a newspaper, and yours truly deployed across the street, waiting and watching. The attempt came like a clap of thunder from the sky. Max was just a wee bit hysterical. Craig, Craig, look how close the bullet came. Here. See the crown of my hat. A hair singe is beneficial, Max. Helps prevent premature baldness. Craig, don't joke. If I didn't joke, I'd cry. He escaped you? Totally. He was staked out somewhere on one of the roofs. On that, frankly, I never figured. Uh, now what? Well, we line up a second try at you. I'll have the roofs covered this time. All the men Lieutenant Trav Rogers over at police headquarters can spare. Sorry to do this to you, Max. The unfortunate thing about murder is you can't always predict where and when it will take place. We had cops staked out on roofs, Max sunning himself on the open street every day for a week. But when the second attempt on Max finally came, it came out of left field. It was in Max's office. In the afternoon heat, summer heat, that dehydrated you every ten minutes. I watched Max idle over to his filtered water cooler. I watched Max pour himself a drink. Ten seconds later, I watched Max turn colors. Craig. Max, what's wrong? Craig, I'm po poisoned. Max. Po Poison in the water cooler, but not enough to kill, luckily. In the hospital six hours later, Max managed a whispered conversation. Craig. Yes, Max. One, two attempts... Number three. Ah, superstition. Fatalistic talk. Think of it this way. Two strikes so far. Strike three, the killer's out. How, how long will I be laid up? Overnight. You got a mild dose. Only enough to give you stomach cramps. Oh, it, it's hopeless, Craig. Alias Alan Merritt would even more in the dark. Better to give up. He's shrewd and slippery, our alias Alan Merritt. But I'll find an avenue to him. From here on, I'm going all out, Max. For utter lack of a lead, I did next best to the aimless thing. I stopped in to admire Oriental carpets in the shop of my original contact, Amar Serebi. Yes, I have heard this sorrowful news. Police check disclosed uh, no next of kin, no relatives. Anatole Barber was alone in the world. How about best friends? Anatole Barber... 
turned friendships away. He was suspicious and secretive. How about lady friends? Ladies? No, I do not think. Oh, come on. Even a suspicious and secretive recluse has some male ego. Some passing interest in the opposite sex. There was a woman. Oh, but such a long time ago. What was her name? Madame Mila Gallard. Know where I can find her? Nobody has seen Mila Gallard for mm, eight, ten years. How close was she to Anatole Baba? All I know to say, she worked in his store, the Mecca Bazaar. They would work together, take their meals together. Sounds chummy enough. Say, uh, Serebi. Yes? Anatole Barber's burial. The police have it scheduled for the day after tomorrow. A potter's field burial under the auspices of the city. Oh, this is regrettable. I shall see that the association extends the honors due him. That is to say, uh, pays the bills for the funeral. Oh, that's fine, but uh, keep that quiet. What I want you to do is spread the word around that a kinsman's being given an obscure pauper's burial. Create sentiment and sympathy. Make old friends and business associates want to pay their last respects. Uh, give Anatole Barber a decent send-off. You think Neela Gallard will hear this and come to the funeral? Huh? I hope Neela Gallard will put in an appearance. Funerals are sad. But to me, this one was a joy. I was all smiles when Amar Serebi whispered the magic words into my ear. That woman standing there, wearing the black veil, she is Madame Mila Gallan. Some hours later, I took tea with Madame Gallant. Her home was a frame dwelling in suburban New Jersey. A middle-aged woman, once beautiful, you could tell, but heavy lines in her face now like she'd known troubled times. I knew it was a mistake to come to Anatole's burial. Now, look, you're a dignified woman, so let's do this with dignity. Don't make me talk like a bad man at cop. I have a sealed envelope given to me by Anatole Baba. I have kept it unopened for 15 years. He wanted it kept unopened? Yes, he was afraid. Afraid of what in the end was his fate. Murder? Murder. Here's the letter. On the, uh, on the envelope, you will see Anatole's own handwriting. To be opened only in case of my death. You're in the total dark, making blind circles, and then a bar of clear daylight knifes through the blackout. Suddenly, you're in the know. I let Max Marcy in on the contents of the letter left with Madame Gallant. Oh, you're a bloodhound, Craig. Oh, you keep moving and hoping. You've sooner or later got the spark. Anatole Barber spells out his secret in this letter. Blackmail. Fifteen years of it. Anatole Barber had been blackmailing an important social figure named Wynne Blake. Wynne Blake? Oh, well, that's very hard to believe. The man is one of 50 best-known people in the world. In the letter, Anatole sounds a fatalistic note. Right in your style, Max. He expected to sooner or later be murdered. The blackmailer's chronic anxiety. They figure the worm has to turn. The sucker must finally strike back. Craig. Yes, Max. What, what's your attitude at this point? Meaning? Oh, don't misunderstand me, Craig, please, but... But? You can speak out openly, Max. Well, do I motivate decisions from now on, or do you? Meaning it was your case originally? There are these new ramifications... A lot of it, none of our business is private operatives. Then a man like this Wynne Blake, a figure his size. We, we bungle handling it somewhere, it could blow up in our faces. Come down to what's bothering you, Max. All right. Frankly, is it any of our business now? It's my business, Max. You can scare off and quit. Figure the angles and decide there's no dough anywhere in it. Only headaches and risks. But don't please decide for me. Murder and blackmail is a public business. And while I'm a private investigator, I'm also a public citizen. <laughs> You're pretty good at speeches, too. All right, forget I said anything. Do what you have to do. What I had to do was go see Wynn Blake, which I did. Blake House was not only upper class, it was the top story of the upper class. 
And the guy who wielded the scepter in the palace looked every inch his role in life. Gray, distinguished, with a stiff, aristocratic spine. A polished surface veneer with only one thing marring it. His eyes. I'd never seen sadder eyes. I wondered when there would be that a man just like yourself, a detective, would come to Blake Manor. You've been wondering that nightmare for 15 years. Yes, for 15 years. The ordeal of it, sir, the eternal apprehension. The ghost in your closet clanking his chains. And these days since uh, the death of Anatole Barber, I've barely weathered them. Remorse? I'm not surprised at the innuendo. I rather expected it. Who else would care to murder Anatole Barber? I have no answer to that. Barber, a leech who's been blackmailing you for 15 years. But I paid his every demand all these years. Why then now would I want to do violence to the man? I've got a simple answer to that. You just couldn't find Barber to kill him. I did not murder or cause the murder of Anatole Barber. What was he blackmailing you for? What did he have on you? Without legal counsel, I'm not sure I... All right, I'll tell you. I was involved in an accident in the summer of 1939. Automobile accident? Yes. A late hour in the driving rain, very little visibility. It was on a downtown street. I struck and killed an elderly pedestrian. Hit and run, huh? I'm ready now to face the charges, but I was coward enough and fool enough to drive away. I let my panic override my better judgment, my more decent instincts. You see... You had a lot to lose, you figured. You didn't want a vehicular homicide against you. I... I just drove away. But not unnoticed and undetected as you believe then. Somebody saw the accident, jotted down your license plate number. Anatole Barber. Mm Mm-hmm. He operated a store where the accident occurred, a rug shop, the Mecca Bazaar. He saw everything through his store window. And he's bled you ever since. He promptly closed up shop and made you his chief business from then on, huh? He exhorted a fortune for me in these 15 years. When did he tap you last? Two weeks before he died. How much did you give him? The usual periodic $10,000 in cash. I left the money in a designated place, as I always did. Barber never showed himself personally. He wasn't taking any chances. Did you hire a private detective to locate Anatole Barber's whereabouts for you? I did not. No, huh? Anybody else in your family aware of your uh, predicament with Anatole Barber? My wife knew, and so does my son. Your wife knew, you say? My wife is dead. Oh. And your son, where is he? He lives away at his school. What's the school? Eagle University, a medical college. Stuart's in the senior class. But my son couldn't possibly have anything... How can you be sure? I... I suppose I cannot be sure. Son trying to get his pop out of a situation. A son nervy enough to commit the murder his father shrinks from doing. Wynn Blake or the son Stuart Blake. I ask you, uh, who else would want to murder Anatole Barber? And so Barry Craig went to college. The college dormitory room is only a box built around silver loving cups, souvenir banners, and pinups of Jane Russell. Barber was vermin. Murder was too merciful for him. They asked me he deserved 15 years of some insidious oriental torture. Did you kill him? Did I what? Murder Anatole Barber. Yeah. Yeah, sure I did. He had it coming, and I gave it to him. Nice try, Sonny. Try? Try at taking the heat off your father. (laughs) My father? (laughs) Dad hasn't got the moxie for the job done on Anatole Barber. But you have, huh? I say I killed him, so let's not beat that question around anymore. Okay, we'll bypass that question for the time being. Now answer me this, and truthfully. Did you hire a private detective to track down Barber? I hired Max Marcier. Do you doubt that, too? Well, proof could help. Proof, huh? Sure. Sure, wait a second. Here. Here's your proof. A receipt. That's right, for $300, a retainer initialed M.M. My down payment to Max Marcy for his services... There was a statue in bronze on the college campus steps, General Somebody or other. There was almost a second statue unveiled there about the time I was leaving. The statue of yours truly, stiff in the joints with an undertaker's glaze on top. A shot that froze me. Froze me, but didn't chill me. 
I was marked for murder. I had the case wrapped up and the killer knew it. I brought Max Marcy up to date. Uh, the son is plainly lying to protect the father. That's my thought. Uh, arrest the father. Under arrest, he'll confess. To keep the boy honest, huh? Uh, to let the son take his, the father's blame. That's the ultimate cowardice. It's unthinkable. No decent father would. You're right there, no doubt. I, uh, swiped a photograph of the son off his bureau top. This, Max. Hmm. Handsome kid, huh? Yes, Strapping. Nothing average about his looks, huh, Max? Way above average in height, size. Very distinguished looking, generally. Crew cut. A break in the beak of his nose. An unusual looking boy, yes. That admission, Max, kind of gives you the lie. The lie? Oh, you mean my description of alias Alan Merritt, do you? Yeah, your nothing description of a man you invented. The big lie you told me. I've just remarked on the uh, glaring flaw in your almost perfect scheme, Max. Scheme? Crime. You, you're accusing me? Of beating my time to Sackett Bay. Of murdering Anatole Barber before I got there. I found Barber for you. You did the rest. But, Craig, consider all the facts. Facts, huh? Facts like the phony fire you set yourself. Or the hood you hired to climb a roof and shoot at you. Or the modest dose of insect poison you deliberately poured yourself from the water cooler. All to blind me to your guilt. Or maybe the fact that you tried to kill me today on the campus steps of Eagle University. <laughs> you are full of ideas, my good friend. Yeah, I am. How much dough have you got sorted away now, Max? I'm penniless. Was. Until you found that gold mine of cash in Barber's shack. The fortune you knew he'd accumulated by blackmailing Wynn Blake for 15 years. You really tried providing for your old age, colleague. Words, accusations, talk, you'll need proof. I know. A tough old bird like you, it will need an army of cops to find that fortune you swiped and stashed away. Sure, proof's going to be tough. But let's start it going officially, huh? You're arresting me? Arresting and charging you. From there on, it's up to the regular police. I've personally gone as far as I care to go. <laughs> You're sentimental about me. No, Max, not a bit sentimental. Just fed up and bored. Your kind of creep I'd rather read about you in the papers. Why well, knock myself out? Walk ahead of me, Max. <laughs> You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Blood Money, was written by John Robert. Next week, our story is titled, Hay is for Homicide, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week's story is titled, Hay is for Homicide, and the reason for this has something to do with a hayride and a farmer's daughter. With that combination, how could it help being uh, murder? Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, and directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Jim Nusser, Marvin Miller, Betty Lou Gerson, Jack Moyles, and Paul Richards. John Lang speaking. There's another exciting dragnet adventure tonight on most NBC radio stations. <laughs>